Good morning. The Lord be with you. We gather on a new day, a new season, a new year. This is the beginning of Advent, a new church year. The Advent wreath is lit. lit. The uh, ornaments are blue, and we focus upon the coming of our Lord. As we begin this time of worship, we invite you to greet those around you with the peace of the Lord.
15. And the order of Max, it's a special and, and old um, order of worship in the church, uh, a morning service, and we follow it this day. Page 219, please rise. O oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. 
He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. O Lord, have mercy on us. Invite our children forward at this time. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Anybody know what the name of the season is that we're starting in the church today? Pardon? Winter. Well, winter. Yeah, we're starting winter this week, I think. You're right. That's the season outside, but there's a season inside the church, too. It's why we have that, that wreath there. It's why I have this blue stuff on me today. We're getting close to Christmas, but Christmas isn't quite yet, is it? No. So we have a season that leads us up to Christmas, and that season is called Advent. Advent. Can you say that word? Advent? Yeah. Advent means coming. And who's coming are we going to celebrate at Christmas? And it's not Santa Claus. <laughs> who's coming? Jesus, of course. Yeah, we're celebrating Jesus coming at Christmas. That's when he's born, right? When he leaves heaven and comes down to earth to be our Savior at Christmas. And so Advent is this season that leads us up to Christmas. And this, what I have here, it's called an Advent calendar. And I have one for each family um, today. And there's a bunch of numbers on this calendar. Can you see those little numbers? And on every number, there's a little flap. And so here's number one. And that means on the 1st of December, which is just a couple days away, then you'll lift up this flap, and it's a shepherd. See the shepherd? And there's a writing there. And you read the writing, and you see the shepherd. And then, so that's all you do for the first day. And then the second day, you find number two, and you lift that up, and it's a sheep. For the shepherd, isn't it? And you keep going all the way through, and we're gonna. There'll one day um, there'll be a stable, and there's gonna be, I bet, um, wise men and angels and Mary and Joseph, and probably on the last day, who do you think um, might be under that flag? Baby Jesus, I bet so. We'll have to find out, but we'll see. But we'll have one of these for each of your families um, that you can use and count down the dates, because that's what Advent is. It's a time for counting down and getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Can you guys pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for Advent, and that you are coming. We love Christmas and your birth. Bless us, Jesus. Love us, be with us always. Amen. Get one of these for your family to use All right.
Maybe next children's sermon should be about sheriff. <laughs> Hard to do when you're three. The epistle uh, for today is from Romans chapter 8. And it picks up this theme of anticipation and, uh, and coming. That, that even creation is anxious uh, for our Lord's coming. Anxious especially for his second coming. Uh, when the bondage to sin is done away for, for all creation. Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The words of Jesus in Luke 21. Jesus speaks about his second advent. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out and leap, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay away at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. O Lord, have mercy on us. Continue with the responsory at the bottom of 221. <clears throat> Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. 
34. to judge the nations a terror to his foes but a light of consolation and blessed hope to those 
who love the Lord and his appearing. He comes to judge. Sometimes as you're flipping through the channels, you might come across the show Judge Judy or one of those other shows that are a courtroom scene and there's some case that's being played out. And you watch till the end because you want to see how the judge is going to decide. It's kind of interesting. If you have ever been before a judge, or if you've had a loved one stand before a judge on trial, you know how your heart feels and, and that dreading and anticipation and wanting to know the end, the result, what the verdict will be far different than when you're just watching it on TV. Well, my friends, you are on trial. You're on trial, charged. You are facing the judge. It's the message of our text this day, that we will all face the judge. But this morning we look at our text for hints that we might know what it is that the judge will say to us on that day, what his verdict will be. As we look at Psalm 96 this morning, uh, we look at it through the lens of three periods of time. First, that God came to the tabernacle. Secondly, that he comes to Bethlehem. And third, that he will come at the end. Psalm 96 is quoted by King David in 1 Chronicles 16. King David used this psalm when he brought the ark, the ark of the covenant, to the tabernacle at Jerusalem. Way back in the days of Eli, the priest and his sons, the ark had been taken into battle against the Philistines. The people thought it would guarantee them victory, but they were going into battle against the word of the Lord without his blessing, and so the ark was captured. In that battle, when the Philistines heard that Israel had the ark, they became afraid, like the Israelites thought, but the Israelites thought then they would run away. But instead, what the Philistines did is they said, we must fight like never before. We have to fight with all our might and all our strength. And they did. And they defeated the Israelites and they captured the ark. Of course, as you know, it didn't go too well for those Philistines having the ark. Their God kept falling down bowing before the ark of the Lord, and all the people developed tumors. And they knew it was because the ark was in their land, and so they sent the ark back to Israel. It was not a blessing, but a curse for them. God had come as judge, and because they had no faith, the judgment was not good. And so the ark sits at a farm, just inside the land of Israel for about 20 years, all through the time of King Saul, who didn't really care about the ark. And then David becomes king, and what does he do? He takes Jerusalem as his capital city, and he sets up the tabernacle there in Jerusalem, but what's missing? Of course, the ark. And so they go and get the ark. 
and bring it to Jerusalem. And when they finally get the ark to Jerusalem, David sings this psalm, Psalm 96. Worship the Lord, come into his presence, ascribe to the Lord, bring an offering, come into his courts. David calls the people to worship, to bring offerings, to rejoice. God is present. He was present in this ark. It was a sign of his presence. He was present now in Jerusalem. And a few hundred years later, this psalm would be used again. Because in subsequent years, the, temp the tabernacle had been um, replaced with the temple. The temple had then been torn down by Babylon. But then after the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel went back and they rebuilt the temple and they used Psalm 96 again. This is a psalm that was used for the dedication of the new temple. The psalm says, all the gods of the nations, they are worthless idols. They have no power. But the Lord, it is the Lord who made the heavens, the Lord who has power. They celebrate God's presence, that he is present. And how do they picture him? They picture him as judge, one who comes to judge with equity, who is fair, just, true. He judges the world in righteousness. He judges the people with faithfulness. Israel saw God and his presence there as a righteous judge. God came to the tabernacle and to the temple. But of course, in this Advent season, we focus on that Advent to Bethlehem. Jesus himself. 500 years after that temple was rebuilt and dedicated, Jesus comes to Bethlehem. God had come with the ark, but now God comes in a greater way, in human flesh, not an ark of wood and gold, but flesh and bone, Jesus born at Bethlehem. He comes holy, righteous. He comes as judge. But there's a problem. You know how oil and water don't mix? Even more so, holiness and sin do not mix. God in his holiness cannot stand sin. He cannot mix with sin. Sin is, is consumed, it dies in the presence of holiness. Jesus comes into this world, our world of sin, and that sin must be consumed. It cannot stay in his presence. But rather than Jesus consuming us, sinners, as he ought to have done, instead, Jesus takes that which was most abhorrent to himself, our sin. He takes our sin on himself and consumes it. He lets the wrath and judgment of God fall on our sin, which is now on him. And so the wrath and judgment of God fall on Jesus, on the cross. Our sin is judged, condemned, sentence given and executed. God's wrath poured out and satisfied in full on the cross. Yes, the psalm says Jesus comes as judge. Judge who will punish sin, righteous, and yet he comes as judge and rescues us by pronouncing the punishment upon himself. Yes, Jesus came 
as judge to Bethlehem and to Calvary. But the sentence was far from what we deserved. And then Jesus is coming again. Scripture is clear. In fact, we call the day when Jesus comes Judgment Day. It's the day of the judge and his judgment when Christ returns. Paul in Romans says all creation is groaning, is waiting for that day when all sin will be finally and fully judged, when creation is released from the bondage of sin. The trees, the plants, the animals, all of them are impacted by our sin. And we too, Paul says, we wait for the redemption of our bodies. Though we have been saved, our bodies are still filled with sin. We wait for that day, judgment day, when our bodies will be raised and restored, holy, sinless, righteous. And Jesus in our gospel tells us, yes, that day is coming. He speaks about the signs, the distress, the shaking of the earth, the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great might, coming as judge. Verse 33, Jesus says, this will happen. Heaven and earth, they may pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is true. It is sure. And so Jesus says, watch. Watch yourselves. That day will be like a trap that springs and no one can escape it. So Jesus says, stay awake. Pray, trust in me, believe that you may escape, that you may stand before the Son of Man. We cannot stand before the Son of Man on our own. We cannot stand in our sin. We can only stand before the Son of Man in the righteousness, in the forgiveness that Jesus gives. And that is only ours when we are children of God, when we trust and love and believe in him. And so the words of the psalmist are true. The Lord, he comes. He comes to judge the earth. It will happen. He will judge the world in righteousness, the people in his faithfulness. You see, God cannot overlook sin. And we have plenty of it. But because of Bethlehem and because of Calvary, that penalty has been paid. God's judgment scales, they do hold true. There is no cheating. But the judgment that is required has been fully paid out by Jesus in his body. Jesus, the one who never sinned, the one who is righteous, is thus able to make us righteous. We will stand one day before the judge. But we know what the verdict will be. We know the verdict for unbelievers, depart from me into the fires of hell. And we know the verdict for all believers. Welcome. Welcome to my heavenly tabernacle, my heavenly temple, my heavenly house. Welcome into my presence. No longer abhorrent no longer filled with sin, but holy and righteous, forgiven and loved. And so we worship our God. We love him. We trust in him. And like creation, we long for that day when we will hear the verdict, not guilty, and be welcomed body and soul into the mansion of our God. And that, my friends, is the way that it is on this first Sunday 
in Advent, in the year of our Lord 2015. In Jesus' name, amen. This theme of creation and even creation praising God, all of heaven and earth and, and all believers and angels, is picked up in the Todayim, uh, page 223. Page 223, the Todayim. Uh, we will sing the first seven verses of the Todayim. Please rise. <laughs> seated. We worship the Lord uh, with our offerings. Also during this time, if you would sign the friendship register, there's a red folder in your pew. If you would sign that and pass it to those who are seated next to you.
prayers this day, we include Elaine Johnson, hospitalized in Alexandria. Uh, we rise for prayer. Our prayers are begin on page 227, and we begin our prayers with the singing of the Kyrie.
Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
who it is that you have been uh, secretly praying for this year. Pray the Lord be with each of you and keep you in his care uh, this holy Advent season. Thank you.